Hi there, and welcome back to part four of the, the last session that we have on the uh, secondary chord movements. We're also going to look at uh, primary and secondary chord slash bass movements. Let's look at the seven chord first. Well, my trusty scale of C, I'll go up to the seventh note of the scale. One, two, we know the chord is not a major chord, we know it's not a minor chord. Why am I counting up? All I have to do is just go back a half step because there's only a half tone between seven and one, so uh, if I go back half a tone, my seven chord is going to be B diminished. My seven chord on E flat, D diminished. Seven chord on G, F sharp diminished. Seven chord on B, A sharp diminished. Seven chord on F, E diminished. Let's go back to the seven chord in the scale of C, B diminished. The seven chord has a very close relationship to the five chord simply because both chords share the same tritone. So wherever a five chord goes, so can a seven. Five chords love going to one, of course. Six and three, likewise, a seven chord enjoys of going to those chords without any problem at all. The seven chord is very seldom used as a triad. It likes to have a seventh added to it. Even if the chord symbol doesn't call for it, you still try to work one in if you can, unless the melody or something like that prevents you from doing it. We have two sevenths to choose from. We have the seven that's part of the scale, in this case A. So that seven is diatonic to the key that we're in. And we also have a diminished seventh, which is a note that is not part of the key that we're in. Both are used. So again, why are we lying a note into the chord that's not part of the scale? Well, two reasons here actually. First of all, a diminished seventh completes the equal division of an octave that a diminished seventh chord gives us. It divides the octave into quarter sections of one and a half tones each. One and a half tones there, one and a half tones there, one and a half tones there, and one and a half tones to the octave. Symmetrically, it's a very nice chord to be able to use because of the fact it's an equal division of the octave. Also, for the same reason, we've allowed that same note into our five chord. Here I have a G7 with a flat nine. The flat nine is a great vehicle to follow onto the fifth of the tonic chord. Likewise, the diminished seventh likes to follow onto the fifth of the tonic chord. And guess what? The four minor chord also likes to fall to the fifth of the one chord. We do have a bit of a problem when we put a seventh on a diminished triad. Do I call that a B diminished seven? And if I do, well then what do I call this, which is a B diminished seven? You can imagine if we have that confusion in a stage band, my guitar player is playing this chord and I'm playing that chord. Uh, well, I don't think it would be uh, too appetizing harmony-wise coming out to the listener. So we have to be able to distinguish between these to sevenths. We use a chord symbol that we call a half diminished seventh. Now where does the half come in? You don't take a seventh and cut it in half. It's to do with an interval relationship. A B to an A sharp is an interval of a major seventh. If I lower that to an A, that's the interval of a minor seventh, aka a seven. If I flatten that one more time, that will be a diminished seventh. So a half diminished is actually the note in between the major seventh and the diminished seventh, that guy, the regular seventh. So we will call this a half diminished seventh, halfway between these two guys, and this a diminished seventh. I wasn't planning on introducing chord symbols because I've done that in other uh, tutorials, but I think in this case, let's just take a look at the uh, chord symbols for these two different chords. A look at the B half to mini symbol. B, of course, is the name of my chord. The small circle says that it's a diminished chord, and the forward slash through the circle tells us that we're using a half to mini seventh. In other words, the regular seventh. Some people put a seven after that, but that's not really necessary because we already know the chord's diminished and the slash tells us which kind of seventh we're using, so we really don't need a seven. Publishers have a problem using that, and many of them will use this chord, which is totally wrong, but it does get some positive results. 
they're saying a B chord first of all make it minor add the 7 and when you finish doing all that flatten the 5 well as soon as you flatten the 5 on a minor chord you have a diminished chord so rather misleading to say the least two categories here these are uh, full-blown diminished seventh chords B diminished or B diminished seventh both interchangeable because you want the diminished seventh in there even if the chord symbol doesn't call for it two other chord symbols that you may come across is B dim D-I-M and B dim 7 again interchangeable these tend to be more favorable because they take up less room than printing out the letters D-I-M so they're the chord symbols for a half diminished 7 and a full-blown diminished 7 let's just take a look at uh, an example of how we might use uh, a 7 chord first of all a 5 chord can move to the 7 chord before moving on to the tonic in other words if I played something as simple as uh, here's my 5 here's my 7 chord half diminished or full blown diminished back to the tonic chord a 2 goes to a 5, a 2 will be happy to go to a 7 chord. Basically, wherever a 5 chord goes, a 7 chord can go. Those two chords are interchangeable. Okay, let's take a look at primary and secondary chord movements. If you viewed my videos on the primary movements uh, part A, part B, and part 1 through part 4 of the secondary movements, then you have a good handle on the chords that are diatonic in major. We know that any chord can go to any chord, so how do we sort out what is likely to be the next chord in a harmony sequence? Quite simply, that's done by looking at primary and secondary chord slash root movements. Let's look at the primary chord movements. Primary chord movements consist of an up four, down three, up two scenario. In other words, if my root is a C chord, C, C minor, whatever it happens to be, the next chord very likely could be an up four, one, two, three, four, the interval of a four, and take me to an F something or another. If that doesn't work, I could go down three, scale tones one two three to an a something or another or up two to a d something or another so those are basically my primary movements an up four is the same as a down five we don't use the terminology down five so if i'm saying up four my next note could be this f or could be that f now let's pick a chord that we can relate to. So let's look at the sixth chord of F. It's going to be D minor. I have no idea what the next chord might be. So if I go by the primary chord movements, the chances are pretty good that it'll either be up four to a G minor chord, my two chord, and if I don't get a hit there and I don't like the sound of that, it could very well be down three to my four chord, the B flat chord, well, interestingly two and four are interchangeable that's not surprising or if I don't get a hit there it could be up to to the seven chord of F the E diminished chord with a half diminished or a full diminished seventh added whatever the case may be so those are my primary chord movements now let's look in the key of C same chord D minor this is now my two chord in C I don't know where it's going to go. Most likely it's going to go up four to the G7 chord, my five chord. Failing that, it could go down three to the seven chord, diminished, half diminished, full diminished, or it could go up two to the three chord. So your primary movements push your music forward. They create forward movement and that's why 80% of anything that Bach wrote or most popular songs use primary chord movements. 
if you don't get a hit on those primary chord movements, you have the secondary chord movements that you can fall back on. Same idea, just the opposite direction. So the secondary movements are down four, up three, down two. I'm gonna use the sixth chord in C as my starting off point. So if I don't get a hit with my primary movements, up four, down three, up two, then I could try going down four to the three chord from the six. So the six. You can feel the pullback there, not the forward motion that we get with the primary chord movements. I don't get a hit there, I could go up three, one of the weakest moves, but uh, nothing much happens. And if I don't get a hit there, I could go down two to the five chord. The secondary chord movements do have a pullback. Uh, they're not used too often in the middle of a, of a piece because most of the time you want the primary movements to keep the music moving forward. However, at an ending of a song is a good time to possibly consider using secondary chord movements, such as a two chord in C, D minor 9 in this case, to a G13, so 2 to 5, deceptive cadence to my 4 chord, down 2, down two to the three chord, down two to my two chord, and down two to my one chord. So a pull back all the way down, great for the ending of a song. The last thing I want to point out is that the one chord, the tonic chord, is exempt from any consideration of primary or secondary movements. Reason behind that is the fact that the one chord is going anywhere has to be forward movement. The fact that you walk out the front door of your house, you're going somewhere. So the one chord is exempt. But once you get outside of the one chord onto another chord, then the primary chord movements kick in. Either up four, down three, up two for primary, down four, up three, down two for the secondary. I hope I haven't confused you. It has been fun doing this series with you. Bye for now and enjoy your music.